final letter, Jesus' message to his church at Laodicea was direct and unwavering. As much as I love, I will rebuke and discipline. So be committed and repent. This is indeed a sobering thought for those of us who find ourselves on a spiritual seesaw. So would you join us? Join us for this time of repentance as we open up our hearts to a loving Savior who is knocking at our door. I'm torn today because this is kind of a bittersweet um, service. This is the end of a love story. Now, I don't know if you know that Revelation really is a love story. It's about what Jesus shares about the love that he has for the church. And because he loves the church and he wants to come back for his bride without spots or wrinkle, he admonishes the church, his bride. And so this is the final chapter of this section, a love story that Jesus writes to the churches. If you recall that over these last, this is the eighth week and this is the seventh church that we're talking about in the book of Revelation. You know, we went through all these different messages and one thing that is consistent is that God loves you. And God loves us. And whom he loves, he corrects, he reproves. You know, I have, you know, three children. And there are sometimes I have to you know, wag my finger. Sometimes I may have to say, you can't watch or use your iPad anymore. But sometimes I may have to be stern in how I talk with them. Because I love them. And God loves us so much that he said, I need to let my church know how I feel. So we find ourselves back in the book of Revelation, chapter 3. And we're talking about the church of Laodicea, which is referred to as the lukewarm church. The term lukewarm is never something that is attractive. If I say that you have a lukewarm relationship with God, it really means that it's to the place that God is ready to spit you out. The scripture which we'll read will say that you're neither hot or cold. You're tepid. You're bitter. And I don't want a bride that is lukewarm. So we have a challenge that Jesus sets for us today. And that is to move from the side of being lukewarm, if that's where we are. And to be able to say that God, I'm willing to let you in. Today's text can be found in the book of Revelation chapter 3. We'll start from verse 14. I'm going to ask everyone to stand with me. Just when you found it, just shout amen. And before we read this, this morning, I'm going to give you a very quick background about the city of Laodicea. It's the southernmost city out of the seven that we spoke about over these last couple of months. It's a city that didn't have any natural water close by, so it actually had to build aqueducts to bring water into the city. These aqueducts brought oftentimes good water, but by the time it reached the city, it became lukewarm. It, it was bitter. So when Jesus writes this letter and he's speaking to them, it's because they understand what lukewarm water feels and tastes like. Laodicea was also known for being a place of banks. It was a very wealthy city, a very rich city. 
In fact, when they had the major earthquake in AD 60, the city said, well, Rome, we don't need any help. We got this. I don't know if you've ever gotten to a place in your life where you say, God, I don't need any help right now. I got this. So there was this arrogance about the people in the city. And Jesus, seeing and knowing this, he speaks to them. And he says the following. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, These are the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. He said, I wish you were either one or the other. Because if you were cold or hot, at least you would be good for something. But because you are lukewarm, bitter, you're neither hot nor cold. You show the signs of quenching someone's first, but you don't do that at all. And because of that, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich. That you've got everything earthly-wise that you need. You say that I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But what you don't realize is that you are wretched. You're pitiful. You're poor, you're blind, and even though you have fancy robes, you're naked. I counsel you, I implore you, I encourage you to buy from me. See, gold refined in the fire. I know you know about gold because you have them in the banks, but I counsel you to buy from me. Gold refined in the fire so you can become really rich. And white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness. And salve or ointment to put on your eyes so that you finally will truly be able to see. Verse 19, those whom I love, what does it say? I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat and have fellowship and have communion with that person. And they with me to the one who is victorious to the one who recognizes their mediocrity to the one who overcomes I will give him or her the right to sit with me on my throne just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne as I was victorious over what? The grave over death. I mean, typical ending fashion, he says, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Can you just tug on your left ear for a moment? Just tug on it. As a kid, my mom used to every once in a while tug on my ear, you know, when, when I wasn't listening. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. I'm going to read this portion again, verse 20. It says, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come 
Just bow your heads with me. Gracious and heavenly Father, we give you thanks this morning that you are willing to stand at the door and knock. Father, I pray, God, that today we'll open up our hearts, our minds, even the most hidden parts of our lives, and allow you to come in. Father, we ask this in your name and we say, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I believe Jesus is knocking today. I want to talk to you about this sermon title. And we know that this is a church that is considered the lukewarm church. But I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, knock, knock. Who's there? Find somebody else and say, knock, knock. Who's there? I remember jokes early on. I mean, that was one of the first jokes, and, you know, I'll share one with you. But this message is not too much of a joking message. It's the only one today. Knock, knock. Orange. Y'all supposed to say orange who? Okay, let's try it again. Knock, knock. Y'all never played this game before? So here it goes. I say knock, knock. You say who's there. I respond. And you say whatever I respond, who. And then you get it. Knock, knock. Orange. Knock, knock. Orange. Knock, knock. Orange. Knock. <laughs> okay. Knock, knock. Banana. Aren't you glad that I didn't say orange? Most of those jokes are pretty corny. But you, you, you'll, you, you'll, you'll get it one of these days, maybe on the way home. But knock, knock. Um, who's there? You know, the church of Laodicea is the final church within the conversation that Jesus has and shares with the, the region of Asia. And once again, he um, gives these messages to John uh, to share and to distribute. And so we find that Jesus is writing to this church in Laodicea. This is what I would say a very wealthy church. Uh, you can tell by the arrogance and, and you can infer by the text that they actually have adopted some of the arrogance of the city. Now, I'll tell you this, oftentimes the church and even you as individuals will oftentimes adopt the environment of where you are. If you're in a place, that, uh, a city that seems to be, uh, um, feel that they're on top of the world, then oftentimes the individuals and the churches and the church at Universal will also sometimes adopt that same mentality. If you're in a region where um, that, that feels is, is under pressure and under weight and under depression, it's interesting that churches there oftentimes also adopt the environment and the identity of what's happening in the city. So in this particular city, there's a number of things that we can see that Jesus is speaking and is cautioning and is loving the church and say, I, I don't want you to be like this. Now once uh, I mentioned earlier that this was a banking city. That means they held um, um, people's accounts. They had a lot of money. No doubt the people that were part of the Laodicean church, they probably, some of them worked for the bank. Some of them had, um, I would say, uh, quite good and healthy lives. They, they were considered to be wealthy. And so when Jesus says, you think that you're wealthy, you think that you're rich, but you're really poor, I believe that they found themselves um, in a place of arrogance, but also in the middle of the road. They were oftentimes compromising their beliefs just to be accepted by others that they may be around. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation. Maybe it's at work. Maybe it's at school. Maybe it's even on your, uh, in your neighborhood where you found yourself compromising what you believe just to fit in. You know, our worship leader mentioned that earlier today, is that we find ourselves compromising, and God doesn't want us to compromise. The church should never be in a situation where we're being labeled as being lukewarm. 
Now, being lukewarm is not a good thing. It was just the other day, this past, maybe a week or two ago, I got into the car. There was a cup of lemonade there, which I had, unfortunately I had left there from hours before. It was a hot day, and I was thirsty, and I picked up the lemonade, and I sipped it, and it tasted disgusting. It was warm. It was lukewarm. I don't know if you've ever had a cup of coffee. Not iced coffee, not hot coffee, but in the middle coffee. It doesn't really seem to do what it really is supposed to do. And Jesus is saying that either you are one or the other. I just can't stand for my church to be in the middle. I can't stand for my church to be playing the role of being the church, but not really being the church. I, I don't want my church to be, uh, uh, have an identity which is referred to, but not living it out. Uh, I don't want my church to be lukewarm. Now, 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 why would Jesus write lukewarm? Why would he say this in his message to the church? And I mentioned before was that in this particular city, they didn't have access to any natural water. Uh, some of the uh, nearby city, cities, Colossae, for example, you know, they got water from the mountain, this fresh spring water. So they would actually have to ship in water to drink in this particular city. Now, for bathing and other things and for cooking, um, in order to get water, they would actually, they, they built what is called an aqueduct. The Roman Empire really perfected this system. And it means that you're bringing water from one place all the way down to another. And so they had this aqueduct system. But by the time the water reached the city, it was bitter. The temperature was off. It had deposits in there that wasn't healthy. If you would cook with it, then your meal would end up turning sour. It was bitter. The term lukewarm is not just referring to temperature. It's referring to the things that are in the water that doesn't belong there. So when Jesus says that you are lukewarm, he talks about not only spiritually are you in the middle, but also there are things that are inside of you that doesn't belong. So you're not refreshing to the world. You're not refreshing to your family members. They don't want to go to church because they're looking at your life and they say, you're lukewarm. I would rather you say, I don't love God at all than say that you are a Christ follower and still be living the way that you're living. I'd rather you be hot or cold. But stop being a hypocrite. And saying that you're one thing, but that you're not. Stop quoting scripture, but not having any faith. Stop saying that you love God, but that you don't love people. You're being a hypocrite. You're lukewarm. And Jesus gives this, I would say, this, this, this hard but graphic message to this church and to our church today. I will spit you out. I don't have any use. I don't have any use with you. Now, I mentioned before that this is a love letter. This is a letter which is Christ is saying that I, I want to perfect you. I want you to understand where you are. I, I want you to know that there's some areas in your life where you're, where you're kind of a little bit shady. But spiritually speaking, you really are not representing Christ the way how you used to. In one of the earlier messages of the churches, it talks about going back to our first love, to when we first really got saved. And for those of you that have already stepped into a relationship with Jesus, do you remember those early days? Those early days of excitement where you couldn't stop telling everyone about Jesus, but now are you gotten too comfortable? Where he no longer is the center of your life. He is just a, I used to have him as Lord. This message to the church was that you're lukewarm. You, you, you've rich, you, you've allowed the comforts and the ease of this life to compromise your spiritual identity. 
and fervency. When trouble comes, all of a sudden you now want to reclaim your spiritual identity. I'm not saying that there's a problem with seeking God when trouble happens. But I want you to know that you don't wait until trouble comes. Until you, you seek God. Uh, I, I'm not saying that you shouldn't pray more when there is an urgent need. But you should pray just as much even if all of your needs seem to be in your hands reach. Because otherwise you're living a life where the text says that you are in the middle. Well, you look warm. I mean, last week we talked about the door of opportunity. And we said, you know, the word says that the door is open. Jesus shares this message. The door is open. And I have the keys. And yet now we see in this letter, this message is that there's another door. But it would apparently appear that this door is now closed. In the message last week, the door that was open is the door of opportunity. The door where Jesus has set before us the opportunity to share the gospel. It's still open. As long as we are here on this earth, the door of evangelism will always be open. But it's up to us for us to now step right in. But however we can see what Jesus is now says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Do we knock at doors that are open? I mean, have you ever knocked at an open door? You knock on the edge, the, the ledge, the side. I know sometimes we, we do that. But in, in, in real, in all, in honesty, I think the doors that we knock at are the doors that normally are closed. Is it possible that as much as you say Jesus is living in your heart, that he's on the wrong side of the door? Because why would he be knocking? Is it possible that there are some areas in our lives that we've actually closed off to him and we find Jesus even talking to us individually and he's knocking at the door and realize he only knocks in places that we've kept close. That he's on the wrong side of the door. We only knock if we want to gain entrance. You know, my brother reminded me of this just a couple of weeks ago. And he said the story wrong, so I pretty much said, no, that didn't happen. You know, he said that um, I almost burned down the house uh, making hot dogs. Was that right, is that what you said? That's what he said. Like when I was, uh, it wasn't hot dogs. It wasn't boiled egg, by the way. But I remember I was, I think I worked maybe a double shift or triple shift or something crazy. And, you know, I was home by myself and um, I was living by myself at this time. And I put something on the stove to, to cook. And now I looked in the fridge. There really wasn't much choices as a young bachelor. So I just took whatever was there and I put the egg inside of the pot, and I just went down and said, I'm just going to, I'll give it a couple minutes, I'm just going to just, just rest a little while. The next thing I know is that I hear this banging on the door. The, the smoke has filled the house. It's dark. There's fire trucks outside glaring. I have no idea what's going on, and they're banging at the door, and I'm like, what is going on? See, they wanted access to what was on the inside. And so they were knocking at the door with urgency. And the next thing is that if I didn't answer, 
they would have broken down the door. I shared some weeks ago that the Holy Spirit is a gentleman. He is not forcing his way into any area of your life that you don't allow him into. He's a gentleman. And there are some things that you will never have victory over until you open the door as he's standing there. And so the invitation that Jesus, and you have to understand that Jesus, who is the King of kings, Lord of lords, leaves his throne in glory, comes down to where we are in your situation at your home, and he's knocking at the door. And there are some times we treat him like Jehovah Witness. Where we hush, hush, and say, nobody's home. Isaiah 43, 11 says, I am Jehovah, and besides me, there is no Savior. He is not Jehovah's witness. He is Jehovah. He is not trying to sell us new phone service or new internet service. He's not knocking so that he can sell us that. You don't have to worry about how many minutes are on the plan. You can call him at any, any time. In fact, Jeremiah 3 verse 3 says, call to me and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things that you do not know. He's not coming and knocking at your door to, take, to get a payment or for you to pay a bill. John 10 verse 10 says, I have come that they might have life and they may have it more abundantly. Jesus is knocking at your door. And if he's knocking, it means that he's in the wrong position in your life. And it's because you haven't opened the door to certain things. And so the church of Laodicea was lukewarm. That they didn't open their hearts truly to what God wanted to do. Now, I don't want to give them a bad name because they're still called the church. And he still wrote a letter to them. And he still loves them, as he still loves us. Don't, for a moment, get it twisted that because it's a hard message, it's because he doesn't love you, or because I don't love you. I believe that when we read the text, all that he's saying is that I do love you. And because I love you, I don't want to have to spit you out, but where you are, how you're compromising your spiritual identity. How you come to the house of God, but you don't live the life accordingly. You're lukewarm. You're playing with fire. And I need you to be one way or the other. As I mentioned, the attitude of this church at the time was one of arrogance and and I pray that we'll humble ourselves even now and say, God, what it is that, what are you speaking to me? What areas of, in my life do I find myself compromising? Young folks, older folks, what are your conversations that you're having when no one else is around? What, what, are, you, what are you watching? What are the things that you're engaged in? Are you really praying? Are, are you really worshiping? I know we sing this song that, you know, Holy Spirit, you are what? Welcome here. Yet the Holy Spirit is knocking. So, so what does that mean? Is that you've made the invitation, but you've never opened the door. That you've sung the words, and the words say, Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Wait, wait, not this door. Behold. Stand at the door and knock. There's a story that is told about this young man who recently got engaged and now is married. And now they're spending their time on their honeymoon. They're, they're driving and he's a little bit impatient as he's looking forward to spend you know, his first night with his new bride. 
So they're driving to the hotel, and the evening itself was a bit foggy. And there was a truck that was in front of the car, and he was impatient. He decides to swerve around the car, I mean around the truck. And as soon as he does that, out of nowhere seems to be a van. The van collides with the car. The car flips a few times and drops about 20 feet down a slight ravine. And they both are unconscious. About 10 minutes in, you know, he regains consciousness and, you know, he's hurt, he's bleeding. Unfortunately, he had a seatbelt on. And he looks over to his new bride and he sees her. She's bleeding profusely. And, I mean, he knows in that moment if, if I don't get her help, this is it. He manages to pull himself out of the vehicle and to his fortune, maybe a few hundred feet away, right up the, the hill, he sees a sign that says, Dr. Joe Calvano. Excited and eager, he goes around to the other side of the vehicle. He opens the door and his wife is still unconscious and he literally picks her up bleeding and he struggles up this hill. He goes up and he's at the door. It's in the middle of the night and he's knocking at the door. There was this desperation in his heart as he's holding his wife and, and, and finally an elderly gentleman maybe in his late 60s, comes down. You know, he's in his robe and night clothes, and he says, now how can I help you? And uh, you know, the guy says, don't you see? <laughs> My wife needs, needs help. And I see that you're a doctor. Thank the Lord. The old man sort of uh, lowers his head and he says, I'm sorry, I don't really practice anymore. The young man at this point is getting agitated. He said, what do you mean you don't practice anymore? So your sign says that you're a doctor. It says you have one of two choices. You either save her or you take down the sign. church either you be the church or you take down the sign because the world is literally bringing people into your lives and our lives that are dying they're looking for a church that is authentic, that is on fire, that can help. And today you have one of two choices. You either be who God called you to be. You either regain the passion that you used to have. Seek God the way how you used to seek him. Love him in every area. Or you stop calling yourself the church. You can't have it both ways. You're lukewarm. I believe today that in this room, we fall in one of a few categories. Category number one is that you are 
in need of a Savior. You don't have a relationship with him. And the Holy Spirit is knocking at your door and saying, can I come in? Can I dine with you? Can I fellowship with you? Especially during these, these times, and this is the first century where this was written. When you were invited to someone's house to eat, it's one of the greatest honors that you could have. And it, was, it wasn't a, let, let's sit down and eat this TV dinner and watch the game. No, it, it was a, a three, four hour affair. Remember Mary and Martha? R remember Zacchaeus? Jesus doesn't want to be on the outside looking in. He wants to dine, dine with you, feast with you, know you intimately. He's concerned about every single part of you. And I don't know, maybe he's tired of knocking. Maybe he's tired of peering through the window, seeing you hide behind the couch. And he knows you're there. And he's, and he's knocking. Like, shh, shh, shh. Not on Tuesday, Jesus. Only on Sunday. Not, not with my relationship, Jesus. O only with my finances. He's knocking. He wants to fellowship with you. He wants to dine with you. He's knocking. So either you've never known him, never welcomed him, or there's certain rooms in your life that you've keeping and kept closed. And I believe every one of us falls into one of those two categories. You've either never let him in or you only allow him in on your terms. Yet, he still knocks. Couldn't be me. Because if it was me and I was knocking and I knew you were there, you didn't open the door. I'm gone. But he knows where you are. He's still knocking. I want to make you hot. I want to make you useful. I, I don't want you to be tepid. I don't want you to be bitter. I want to make you sweet. I want to make you useful. I, I want to change the way how you do life. I want to change the way how you love your children. I want to change the way how you study, how you do school. I want to do those things. With, just let me in. And if you're not going to do that, then stop singing the song, Holy Spirit. You're welcome. In the final letter, Jesus' message to his church at Laodicea was direct and unwavering. As much as I love, I will rebuke and discipline. So be committed and repent. This is indeed a sobering thought for those of us who find ourselves on a spiritual seesaw. So would you join us? Join us for this time of repentance as we open up our hearts to a loving Savior who is knocking at our door.